I've been wanting to do this filmmaker for a while, and I'm really happy that I'm getting the chance to with David. We're covering Zero for Conduct today, 1933 short film by the one, the only, Jean Vigo, um, the greatest anarchist filmmaker um, on the face of the earth. Uh, only made three short films and then one feature film, La Talente, which is arguably the finest romantic picture ever made, arguably. Uh, and Zero for Conduct is is what we watched today, and it is ex um, extraordinarily, I think, free for me. Um, Jean Vigo being the son of a, of a French anarchist who was executed by the state, anarchy is in his blood. He actually... Anarchy is his lived reality, is how he views the world, and he was able to express that through uh, kind of the surrealism of a, of a boarding school, of a boarding house, which is also uh, derived from Vigo's own childhood. Um, he depicts uh, the, the bureaucracy of youth, and um, this kind of shows us what wild kindness is, like a wild freedom. What did you think of it, David? I was really immersed in it. Um, Particularly, I was immersed in it for the setup. It was set up in a in an educational system in France, where it was um, it was controversial because it was one of those films that it, it, it essentially in a state of anarchy and just like you're saying, it was a fun play. Um, my first initial impressions on it was one of like cajoling and carefree, and uh, sort of an abolishing of ideas and rules. And particularly, we see Jean Vigo's performance and his contribution as the director, the auteur, mm -hmm. in I think having... The, yeah, the catharsis of this mm -hmm. film is unreal. Because uh, when the kids finally do rebel and it's shot in that beautiful, uh, with the, the, the pillow feathers yeah. everywhere and the slow motion, the kid doing the backflip onto the throne, really, while they pick him up with their black flags, it's hard not to just feel some undeniable cathartic feeling from it of like tapped into that part of you that's always that child that just wants mm -hmm. freedom like that part I of you that's been felt that. beaten out of you by like the by bureaucracy by bureaucrats by uh, by systems even by society <laughs> by, yeah extent. just by yeah. society itself and out, and you can also feel the catharsis from the auteur from vigo of what he wished he could do or how he views the world or like mm -hmm. you know and it was so beautiful and authentic in that regard for that particular scene because it showed how John Vigo was aware that time is kind of like its own thing for each mm -hmm. individual person. And that's why it was set in that sort of slow motion still of the feathers falling and this uh, triumphant music happening in the background and all the kids with smiles on their faces and absolutely hand and, in hand. I love the first thing that you see is like black screen with like, you know, text but it's uh it's children like like you said cajoling like 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 this yelling being very free being very natural or authentic and it's interesting um let's go into some of the stylistic qualities of the film because uh it's only it's only about 45 minutes long and we see hints of german expressionism in the lighting scheme sometimes especially with uh with mama bean or whatever uh with, with the shadows and the way those look um a lot of the silent film that's why some of the that's why the 30s is one of my favorite eras for film is because some of the silent movie aesthetics are still there and i think that they're like beautiful and you see some of them here certainly not only in comedy but in german expressionism but at its core this film is surrealist and absurdist and incredibly avant-garde exactly and i wanted to build on that by saying um how it was uh, in the spirit of that absurdism and that surrealism by uh, sort of lambasting against the structuralism of the past oh, and the yeah. structuralism of schooling and educational systems and the, and the environment in which this movie is set in. And it's doing this and it's sort of uh, passing on the baton to the post-structuralist movement. Absolutely. And I think that Vigo wants it to be completely clear that... Um there is always a monitor. There is always like someone in control of of any system of images that you're seeing to the point where he will deliberately go out of his way to harsh cut to make you understand there is an architect behind the camera, mm -hmm. and that even the uh, that film itself is almost trying to engage in a rebellion against its own narrative. Yeah. Um, let's talk about. Um, some of the surrealist motifs in it i think that it had to be surreal it had to be absurdist because this is a love letter to anarchy 
And I think that you have to, to, to not only base it through the eyes of like naivety or purity, really, of, of, of children, and you also have to make it absurdist because it can't be, uh, it can't be completely earnest. It can't be um, overwrought or melodramatic because that's not what I think freedom is to Jean Vigo. I think that freedom is almost indescribable. What do you think? What do you think freedom means to Jean Vigo? Uh, I would like to start by describing one of the opening scenes, which I think just started to capture that ethos of how he views freedom. Um, in the opening scenes, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing two schoolboys boarding a train and inside the train with the billowing smoke outside, you know, s- signaling that kind of surrealist uncertainty. But at the same time, they're still making spirit in light of the uh, situation. Yeah. And they're doing all of these tricks and pulling all of these things out of their coats. And it's all manner of tricks and the feather and the cap and everything. And uh, at the very end of it, they light up some cigars and start smoking. And then it shows them finishing up and saying, you know, the guy who's supposed to be watching over them is a dead man. Yeah. And and that was like, to me, symbolic uh, of the surrealist motif that, you know, he doesn't have the spirit of that a childhood anarchy, so he's dead. <laughs> right? So then that was said um, indirectly. But the thing is... And then there's the no smoking sign as they're leaving. But the that, that symbol of, like, he doesn't have a childhood anarchy, so he's dead, is, uh, I think, expanded upon, mm-hmm. obviously, metaphorically. Which is why I mentioned it, yeah. Because he's, obviously, Jean Dasty playing the... Uh, playing the monitor who is full of this childhood anarchy. So he's actually playing dead. <laughs> so that symbolism is beautiful. It's mm-hmm. the game on top of a game on top of a game. Uh, I, I, I just really, I really do appreciate this movie. I really appreciate good anarchist art. It's hard to come across anarchist art that is authentic. Um, and this film feels extremely authentic. Yeah, primarily because of John Vigo's interactions with his boarding school when he was a child growing up. He was able to... um, I know that John Vigo was um, one of the starving directors, like he was very poor. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, a big part of the authenticity and sincerity of the film and the language that's being employed is because we see this sort of understanding of what it means to be poor, eating ma's, beans every single day kind of thing. Absolutely. And he, he had to grow up in a disgraced French family. And as we said, his father was a notorious anarchist who was executed. And uh, just what an interesting life. I still think that him dying of tuberculosis at 29, Jean Vigo, is mm. one of the cinema's greatest losses. Because if, like, this is one of his only few contributions to the history of film. And I can only imagine what it would have been like if he had a full yeah. career, the, the maturity of, of Or even thought. just 10 more years. Even Dude, just 10 more years. Yeah. And, uh, T- uh, Truffaut and Godard, uh, probably, Truffaut would probably tell you he owes just as much to Vigo as he does to Renoir, like that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, Vigo was incredibly important, almost proto-New Wave. The things that he was doing was incredibly experimental. Uh, Zero for Conduct is a very um, ab- abrasive film that, that really... That doesn't care if you're in on the rebellion or not. It's going to happen. And I I just love the way that that rebellion is finally filmed, finally uh, consummated, really. And I think they they tackle some really interesting subject matter, too. I mean, the topic of homosexuality, even uh, amongst children, is tackled here. Pedophilia is also tackled here. Um, (laughs) But always with an incredible amount of absurdism, but nonetheless, it still feels important or significant. Like this isn't like uh, just a cartoon, although there are cartoons in it that like move and talk and like interact with, uh, with the real life characters. And of course, certain characters are cartoonish. I mean, the headmaster is, is a little mm, person yeah. who like looks ripped out of a David Lynch film or like a Tim <laughs> Burton movie or something. And then he has those really odd shoes, cushion shoes. Yeah. I don't <laughs> It sounds completely absurd, but it's almost like that that good balance between um, like being incredibly self-aware, but also deathly serious. It's like a yeah. really good balance. There was that juxtapositioning throughout the film, and I thought that was very well done now that you mention it, because good. I had that, that um, impression. Because uh, Vigo <laughs> makes it clear that there are like consequences to this rebellion that has no purpose, it has no end in sight. It's just to rebel. 
It's just to be alive, to be free in that moment with that black flag and those children on the roof. Is just... And that's why that whole scene right there was just set in slow motion. It was like a, a time and eternity kind of thing. Absolutely. I'll, I'll never get over how beautiful that, that sequence looked. And they're all just carrying the banner of anarchism. And it's just beautiful. Uh, how, how do you feel this movie expresses the concept of anarchy do you think it does a good job at it at expressing like a personal anarchy or something like that Hmm. well it does it very well and it does it much more uniquely than any other anarchist film i've ever seen Mm -hmm. um even even the films that uh like fee for vendetta where they do go directly in favor of anarchy against a a sort of bourgeoisie state taking over and just just dictating people's lives is still set in such a way that it's not like, it's not like you're thinking about things in a total or a totalitarian perspective of all or nothing. Instead, you're given a lens of, you know, why is it that we have to um, do these kinds of silly rules all the time for all of these different things. And a big part of the spirit of that and what I think is beautiful and what John Vigo's portraying and communicating is how the most important moments of our lives where we're learning is not set in an an environment that is stiff and uh, really just drowning. Absolutely. But instead it's in a spirit, it's in a, it's in a, uh, an exhilarating fashion, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's how learning is in our minds or learning is, one of these triumphant moments where we are able to finally get some sense of understanding about something. Yeah. And in this particular case, it is about anarchy. It's about uh, going up against the rules, even the rules of directing. And there is one particular scene that stands out where there's this cut and it's in an unabashed cut. Yes. And it's just the kid throwing a ball. But it's like, why is it there? It's just the kid throwing a ball. He didn't need to cut that. Oh, but it's he did. wonderfully cut like that to to, to make you realize On that purpose, there's like a, yeah. yeah a controller to, to everything. And I really like. Um, I mean, at that age, you're developing your own morality and your own mm-hmm. idea of freedom, and you're at arguably, inarguably, I would say, your purest and most authentic self. And like you said, that kind of bureaucratizing of the educational system is just taking away that authenticity, taking away that pure self. What do you think he was trying... Do you think that Jean Dasty's character as as, a, as the monitor, as the teacher who was kind-hearted and pure of heart, really pure of spirit, do you think that that was maybe Jean Vigo injecting his own point of view Possibly. in it? Or like who, do, who does he represent within the concept of anarchy? That's a good point because it brings up one of my favorite scenes in this short film. It was the moment he decided to impersonate the tramp Yes, from uh, Charlie Cha- Chaplin's the Tramp, and he's got the silly walk and the cane and the hat t- uh, doffing from the back kind of thing. That's great. Um, what I really enjoyed about that contribution is exactly what Charlie Chaplin was really trying to communicate as just a pivotal figure in history is the the care and the concern for our children because they're the kings and queens of our future. Mm-hmm. And what kind of world are we creating when we make people just follow in line and follow these rules. And that kind of spirit of anarchy just is not only just triumphant, but it's also this sort of parade really of that. Like Vigo found it grotesque. So (laughs) so unnatural to be, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, to be controlled, to be dominated by something that, uh, that has no real integrity. I think he found it so grotesque, so ugly. But what did you think of like, but yeah. him as a symbol, as a know. symbol of that, I think he is. He was within the system, yeah. but apart from it. And he, I think he was. He's kind of that key to power that the kids needed in order to see the beauty of that. Mm-hmm. And, and he praised their rebellion at the mm-hmm. end. He was down on the ground, almost blowing kisses. <laughs> like yeah. And he, he was happy for them in every way. And he was sincere. And all he cared about was that they learned to think for themselves, to be themselves, to embrace themselves for who they are and all their weirdness. Mm-hmm. And John Dasty would be wonderful. He was in La Talante, too. So he worked with Vigo twice. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. a big w- reason why he emulated the weirdness. Yeah. 
his hair was always disheveled. He was doing handstands. He's uh, <laughs> uh, chasing down women in the street. You know, <laughs> uh, what, what what would be your your final major takeaway from from, from this short film? My major takeaway is the importance of how how it is anarchy should it should be viewed, right? I believe so too. I that's honestly what I would say about that. I would say not necessarily that's a very moral a very powerful moral statement. I get that. I think it's one right. of the most like maligned and misunderstood like right. philosophies to yeah. exist. Because you get so many people who do the fear mongering, the slippery slope the mm-hmm. this and that the uh or the surface level oversimplification of the concept yeah or the polarization of things yeah. too all of those things to me just really take away from the actual spirit of anarchy which is a childlike want for freedom for liberty for being able to do whatever you want to be able to sleep in bed yeah. a little late to uh <laughs> have a pillow fight to you know what i mean I, yeah I love the tender moment when they're having that food fight and they're throwing the beans and they're like going down, down with my, my beans, down with my beans. But then my bean's son is like really taken aback by by this revolt because they're revolting against the wrong person and it's affecting one of their own. Mm-hmm. And so they all stop. They all stop that rebellion. Exactly. And they and save it for the true king. Mm-hmm. And that was, to me, one of the moments where I thought that 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 sincerity and the directing of the anarchist idea that's being portrayed here, I think that was very important that he did it that way, that he recognized that mm-hmm. that there is that kind of mob mentality when it does come to this sort of ideology, right? There's that, of course. and that how that mob mentality can cause a great uh, destruction on right. things. It flies in the face of everyone who would think that anarchy is like, blind or aimless or uh, right. almost without morality. And mm-hmm. anarchy has morality. Yeah, <laughs> I would definitely agree. And uh, this was a wonderful, wonderful film. And I want to thank you guys for watching this video. And uh, definitely subscribe if you haven't already. Zero for Conduct is a wonderful film. Um, my name is Zachary Conan. And I'm David. And thanks for listening. <laughs>